Well, uh, good morning once again. I'm Robert Massey. I'm from the Royal Astronomical Society, and we're also a sponsor of this event. Crucially, we're sponsoring the drinks reception this afternoon, which I, I feel is a popular bit of the day. Not the most, not the most, the most popular, but a useful bit. Um, it's my pleasure to chair these sessions here, and uh, we have two uh, distinguished speakers. Um, first up, we have uh, Bruce Sibthorpe, who is a systems engineer at Airbus Defence and Space. And Airbus is a company I know quite well. I do communications work with them every so often, and they, for example, have been responsible for the Schiaparelli Mars mission that's landing this afternoon, as well as things like Rosetta, which landed or crashed um, a couple of weeks ago crash deliberately, obviously, in case you're not aware of that. Um, so it's really a pleasure to hear from somebody who's moved out of the, uh, the astrophysics arena into industry and into a bit of industry that I think a lot of astrophysicists really quite like. You know, it's really quite an, an interesting place to be. So um, we're going to let both speakers talk for about uh, 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have 20 minutes together with them together at the end on a panel. So hopefully able to answer any of your questions. And one of the other things uh, Vishanti has asked me to do is under the hashtag PhD chat, please uh, tweet. And if your tweets are quotable, so much the better, because we'll probably use it. So just to warn you, thanks. But it would be really helpful as well. So over to Bruce. Thanks. OK, so when I was uh, thinking about what to say at this today, I, there's lots of advice that I think people want to give. And I've always found various advice that I've been given sometimes contradictory, sometimes sounds great, and it tends to, be, it tends to be a bit different to what is the reality. And the advice you're getting, I've always found, is uh, obviously you have to, it, it depends on who you speak to. So you can ask academics like John, who was here earlier, who spent his whole career in academia, and he has one very specific point of view, and it's a very perfect, entirely valid point of view. And many of you may go to your supervisors or other academics and ask them, and in many cases, uh, contrary to the questions that were being asked this morning, most of them have spent their entire career in academia. Now, that gives you a different point of view. Then you can go to people who, in industry, and again, that's different. So rather than trying to give advice, I'm just going to give you a sort of case study, so my career my background, what I'm doing now, and at the end of that, we can have some questions. I might end up giving advice, but remember, I'm biased as much as anyone else is biased. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. So I'm going to go through my career. It's a sort of career in pictures. I've tried to keep the text to a minimum. So obviously, I put a nice picture behind here, by the way. This is a, uh, an image from a project I worked on, and is uh, both as a, an astrophysicist and also as a te technical instrumentationist. So uh, I like this picture. It's the only one of these particularly fluffy kinds of pictures I've put in. So I started my PhD in 2003, and I was working on this project. This is the Herschel Space Observatory. It's a fire infrared mission. It launched in 2009 and died about four years later. It died by design because it ran out of the cryogenic coolers, which are necessary to, to, to keep the system cold and observe in the fire infrared. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about, detail about the specific mission, but I'll tell you about, about my PhD and my role in that. So I was responsible for developing the, uh, an instrument simulator. So this is a piece of software which would simulate the instrument, its operation, and in-flight performance. So we could try and investigate how it would operate uh, and optimize the system before it launched. Herschel's total cost was about a billion euros. So it worked out as a million euros a day of operation. That's all in. Launch, development, maintenance, everything, including disposal. So if I could save a few days during my one PhD, whatever PhD funding is, or was at the time, that saving in real terms is, is quite substantial. But the interesting thing with doing that task is I had to create a simulator which would uh, model numerically all aspects of the system. Now, this is a really good training for me, and this has served me, I think, for many years to come and in time, my entire career because it gives you a system level approach. I mean, it says in my career, in my, my job title, systems engineer. I mean, you can tell that that's a direct consequence of this work. So you would simulate all these different aspects, but not only do you need to sim simulate all aspects of the system, including the astronomical sky, the thermal environment, etc., you need to think about what the primary uh, systems are that are affecting the quality of the data that you'll receive. Now, that gives you a whole sort of management set of skills. Obviously, it's programming developing through this work, but the management skills, the way to weigh up different models that you might need to do. For example, there are certain types of noise that will be simulated in the system that will dominate. So I could spend 
two years of my PhD working on a simulation of a very high fidelity subsystem, which will then be trounced by some other noise simulation. So it's a case of waiting, weighing up the different aspects and putting the time into the appropriate place. And this is something which is a, you know, these sort of skills and managing your time, although that's a very cliche thing, but it is not managing my time in a day-to-day -day sense, but making sure that I'm focusing on the right problem, the right questions. And obviously this brings up lots of additional uh, problems identifying those problems and seeing how best to attack those. So as John said earlier, it's about finding these problems and tackling them in a sensible way, but also an efficient way, because if you're working as part of a large team, you can't be the one holding everyone else up. So this is the actual telescope. It's always nice to show a picture of it actually in the clean room. This is in the clean room in the European Space Agency uh, uh, Science Technology Facility in Estec, in, uh, called Estec in, in the Netherlands. So it's quite a big telescope. It's the, it was, at the time, the largest single solid aperture telescope ever launched in space. And here's the launch in 2009. I always like to have a, a rocket picture because it makes you feel like more rockety, more rocket science. It's always fun to have a rocket picture. Normally, there's an animation and everything, but, well, it's better not to risk that kind of thing when you don't know what the presentation room is going to be like and everything. It invariably goes wrong and you look silly. OK, so here are some of the data that came from it. Um, in the top left is the optical image. This is the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, in the top right is the Herschel image. And this, I hope, shows the way that all these different wavelengths and these different spacecraft uh, can be put together. And they're all seeing different things. So you can see the, um, a nice composite in the middle, which shows the X-rays and the infrared. But if you look on the top left image where it says optical, you can see that where there are these dark lines, that's actually the bright areas in the infrared. So you're seeing different parts of the galaxy. And when you want to do that, you need to look at different parts which are uh, governing different physical processes, star formation, etc. So just a nice image. Here's another nice image. This is a, for another project I was involved with. This is a, this is a, a disk, a planetary disk around a star called Fommelholt. And uh, it's nice in that this is showing uh, material, dust, that is in orbit of this star. And this is new dust created by the collisions of comets. And this is important because the fact that these, this dust is there shows you that planet formation has started in this, pro, in this system because you need those uh, asteroids to hit each other and produce particles. Anyway, so that's where the disk is. And by the way, the thing in the middle is also another small disk just very far in. It's not the star. In this image, you can't see the star. So just another image example of the kind of work that's been done and the kind of career I've had. I've done a work in the astronomy side of things and not just the technical side. Uh, I've also worked on ground-based observatories. This is the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. So here, I worked on the Scuba 2 instrument. So when I finished my PhD, I went to Edinburgh and worked for STFC in the UK Astronomy Technology Centre in Edinburgh and uh, helped. Uh, there I was supposed to be focusing on astronomy, but I like technical work. I've always liked technical work. And so I also got involved with the technical work associated with Scuba 2 instrument, doing again system optimization and spent some nice time out in Hawaii for quite a while. Uh, a lot of the work that uh, was done at the time is still in use in terms of how it observes. If any of you have used this sort of facility, then you'll have used the observing modes probably that I helped develop. So that's a, a very rewarding thing to do. It's also nice to work on some ground-based stuff because if you muck it up, you can fix it. If you launch it into space and it goes wrong, you've got a problem. So after that, I moved on to work at uh, the Dutch Space Research Organization. So that's called ESRON, and on this particular project. Now, I think this is the only image I have of this. This is a, pro a mission which is in development. For this, this is called Speaker, and the instrument we were working on is called Safari. So it's the spectral fine thread instrument, I think. Yes, um, and that is a, a mission that is proposed. The, the proposal for that has just gone into ESA, and there will be a competition in, in uh, spring next year. There will be a decision as to which missions which were submitted will be selected to be studied and potentially become a future mission. This is in the fifth medium class mission call. So I was, uh, as part of my work here, I was doing a lot of management of the science team, developing the science program, but also developing the instrument concept. We had an instrument concept, but we decided to revise it. So we had to go through um, a whole lot of process to decide what the requirements are. So what do you actually need from this facility? How big does the telescope 
mirror itself have to be to get the sensitivity that you need to do the science. So these are all very engineering processes, science processes too, but you need to figure out what you need and why you need it. It's a very sort of uh, methodical approach. Once we had that, we also uh, did a lot of work with ESA at the, um, this is the concurrent design facility, again, at STEC. Now, I've concluded this because it looks quite spacey. Uh, there is actually another ring of tables around here, but uh, the people you see in the foreground towards the left, these are technically the customer, and everyone else is an ESA engineer. So you get electrical engineers, um, propulsion engineers, all of the other aspects that you need. And the point here is to get together and design an entire mission, sort of rough it out in a few days. And it's a really nice way of working. Everyone has a, a little sort of UN-style microphone like this with a little speaker, and you press the button, and you have your little moment to speak, and we're just communicating in real time like that, which is a really nice way to work. And you can see on the screens in the background that uh, in the top right of their screen, you can see that's probably uh, uh, ESOC in, in Spain. And when we were doing it, there were people, we were collaborating with the Japanese, the Japanese space agency, JAXA. So we were doing all of this work together. And it was a real, this is, a, is, this is sort of where you start to get the blending, I think, of industry and academia. It's not fair, I think, when people talk about at least space industry like this, uh, as academia and industry, it, th there is a separation. But that separation is far more fluid than people often give it credit for, and also far more fluid than many of the people in academia or in the industry really want to accept. But that feeling is changing. I'll come back to this in a bit. But um, where I am now, I'm currently working for Airbus Defence and Space. Now, this is, I, I always try and defend the space side. It's, it's part of the business. But I work on the space side and the science side. So I don't, if you have any questions about the Eurofighter or the military aspects or the missiles, that's, uh, I can pass you a, lot, a name to speak to, but I, I can't tell you about those. No, honestly, I have no interest in that either. But we do work on the uh, Airbus Saffron launchers, the rockets. Uh, and there's a great deal of work that is done which I think directly relates, well, to the science aspects I've done previously. So this isn't a diff change, it's a continuation uh, in, in a career path. So just as a bit of background, I should say also, if you've ever heard of it, Airbus was formerly a couple of years ago Astrium. It just changed name, they consolidated into one big company. Um, but it's a, a naming thing more than anything else. So Airbus Defence and Space is the, uh, as it says on here, the number one in uh, defence and space and number two in space in general in the world. Um, 40,000 employees, 14 million billion, uh, euros in revenue. The point of saying this is it's a big company. Uh, you can move around. There's lots of uh, Airbus Defence and Space. I keep saying Defence and Space because it's distinct from Airbus Group, which is the aircraft. And there's a, another subsidiary, which is the Airbus Helicopters. So these are all separate organisations. So Airbus Defence and Space is, is a very large entity in itself. Uh, I work in Stevenage, just north of London. There's also another base in um, Portsmouth in the UK and various other satellite ones around the UK doing different aspects. Uh, we also have uh, several, uh, several large sites in Germany. Uh, there's a big one in Toulouse and others in France and also in Spain. So it's a very transnational organisation. And this is a useful thing. If you have an issue with uh, job security, then you can get a job and still move around. It's big enough to move around without leave, leaving that. So there's a sort of mid-balance there uh, in terms of not maybe wanting to, to follow the academic career and if people are uh, wary of the job security that academia brings, then this, is, this kind of thing is an alternative. And obviously, this isn't limited to Airbus. This is just a case study. There are many organizations like this that you could uh, consider working in, not in just the aerospace industry, but in various engineering aspects. And many of those organizations would be very pleased to have uh, people with a strong physics and analytical background. So quickly, what we do, the large part of it is telecoms, um, huge clean room facilities, uh, building large numbers of telescope, uh, uh, telecom satellites. Uh, Earth observing, I'm working on an obser Earth observing program at the moment, which will measure all of the biomass of the Earth. Uh, navigation, science, that's where I really work. There's also transportation, in that they have the ATV uh, vehicle, which we feel uh, uh, fuels the ISS, and also uh, exploration. 
This is a project which happened a few months ago, earlier this year, where they had Tim Peake driving the Mars rover. This is the Mars rover that will be going in 2020, which follows up from the Scaparelli probe, which lands today, uh, successfully, I'm sure. Um, and this, uh, this is Bridget, so it's one of the rovers that we have on site. So this is on the right-hand image. Obviously, this is Tim Peake in the space station. On the right-hand image, we have a picture of the rover that's being driven around. And this is testing a whole lot of networks and communication arrays for various real-world applications that are necessary for future uh, projects. This is actually an incredibly difficult task. It's not just a case of logging into the computer on the ground. It's, there's a lot of work in here. And this is uh, all dark as well because it's trying to see how well it can be controlled and uh, what can be learned about controlling these uh, uh, robotic exploration missions remotely in caves or dark areas or shadows or craters. So this is a, this is a real experiment. It's not just the publicity stunt. But this is all again done in Stephenage up the road. So, uh, one of the main projects I'm working on at the moment is, like I said, biomass. I've used this as a, an example. This is from the BBC News, obviously. And this shows uh, a large radar project which will be measuring all of the wood, effectively, all of the tree biomass on the Earth, excluding North America, Europe, and Russia for some reasons. Um, so, that's uh, an interesting project. It shows the kind of work that's being done. This is uh, we're talking about science and, and, and doing interesting new things. Engineering is doing interesting new things. Engineering is not uh, putting things together. It's not building cars. Engineering is th thinking about the problem, addressing it, thinking of technology which addresses it, and in ne if necessary, developing that technology in collaboration with universities and um, pushing forward and making uh, uh, new uh, studies possible. So this is all part of it. It shouldn't be considered as a support role. This is part of the whole thing. John was talking about the LHC and the particle physics work. LHC is a massive engineering project and there's a lot of engineers working with standards and, and managerial practices which are employed across a variety of projects. And there is scope to working any area of that continuum from academia to pure engineering and many places in between. So this is the graduate scheme I'm going to put up. Just going to, I'll have a few words to say after this, but the graduate scheme that we have in Airbus is, is I think, particularly good. You have a, a single one-year job assignment, but then you can move around between different groups to see what you like in different areas. Those groups can be in different countries if you want. You can know that you'll come back to your home group, and if you like it, you can think about where you want your career to go. It's the flexibility of the large organisation. Um, I say graduate programme because it is for people coming out of their... It's not, rather, it's not just for people coming out of their undergraduate degrees. People with a PhD are highly valued. They will jump to the top of any list and progress much more quickly through to a more, se to, to, to a more senior level much more quickly because uh, they are recognised as having a lot of skills which are necessary to really make, this, uh, make a career uh, and get there quickly. And that's a particularly useful thing to any potential employer. Um, so... I put it here just as, as a sign. Uh, also, for anyone with a few more years of experience after their PhD, there are several jobs open at the moment for the similar role to what I do. And like I said, my role is mission systems engineer. So I work in the future programs group. So I look at new projects coming up, how to address them, what kind of technologies. We study uh, small exploration missions, te develop technology, and see what's coming and, and try to uh, work towards that. One other project I'm working on at the moment is um, a project called Plato. I have no pictures for it because it's still in development, but uh, Airbus are bidding to be the um, pri what's called the prime contractor, so to build the spacecraft for Plato. This is an exoplanet uh, uh, mission which will detect new planets around other stars, and we should um, have those decisions. Those decisions should come out uh, next year. Um, I am currently working as what's called the prime payload. Uh, team manager basically means that the instrument, the telescopes on board, I work to make sure that they fit into the spacecraft and I coordinate with the academics. Now, I've got that role because of my background in academia and in uh, uh, industry. So there's a whole, like I say, it's a continuum. It shouldn't be seen as a discrete change. Many people, when you speak, in my experience, many people will see a discrete difference between industry and academia. And that is often a result of their background. So my number one take-home message would be to be careful of that kind of uh, issue. So I'll stop there so we've got time for questions later.